Well, welcome everybody. And so I think you will see this section is gonna be definitely pediatrics. Uh, I know the adult gastroenterologists, I don't think, talk a lot about nutrition, and hopefully we do. So the, question, the topic I was asked to discuss today is, can nutritional therapy be used as a practical basis for maintenance therapy? And these are my disclosures. So nutritional therapy. Exclusive enteral nutrition is the most obvious and ignored clue to the effects of diet on the environmental factors of IBD. I think most of us in this room do believe that induction therapy with enteral nutrition works, usually six to eight weeks, but the big question is what do you do next? You know, all of the studies of the microbiome of inflammatory bowel disease shows there's a dysbiosis. Dysbiosis is altered microbiota composition that's associated with disease. So how can you disrupt this dysbiosis? Maybe antibiotics, probiotics, prebiotics. Clearly fecal transplantation works for C. difficile. I'm gonna be talking about dietary intervention. So this is a study where they looked at, does diet, is a diet associated with new onset IBD? In the study, they showed that diets that are high in total fats, polyunsaturated fatty acids, omega-6, and meats are associated with increased risk of developing Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. High fiber and fruit intakes are associated with a decreased risk of getting Crohn's disease, and high vegetable diets decrease your risk for developing ulcerative colitis. So what is the link between diet, dysbiosis, and inflammatory bowel disease? Well, hypothesis one, Regular diet contains harmful components that lead to inflammation. Hypothesis two, diet alters the gut microbiome which leads to inflammation. And hypothesis three, diet determines the metabolic products of gut microbes that impact health and disease. So let's talk about hypothesis one. Regular diet contains harmful components that lead to inflammation. There's a study we had done at our institution, we call it the PLEASE study. It's a pediatric longitudinal study of semi-elemental diet and stool microbiome. It was a prospective cohort study between kids with Crohn's disease at, in Philadelphia, Toronto, and Halifax. Children were treated either with enteral nutrition, with a defined formula diet, or the control was an anti-TNF population. We looked at PCDI, Pediatric Crohn's Disease Activity Index, at baseline in eight weeks. And we looked at stool for calprotectin and microbiome at baseline one, four, and eight weeks. So this slide's titled, Greater Mucosal Healing with More Restrictive Diet. Okay, we used our outcome measure at the end of eight weeks as a calprotectin dropping below 250. If you look at that first column, the blue column, the partial enteral nutrition, this group, the children received 80 to 90% of their total caloric needs for induction, and then we told the kids they could eat. A little bit to our surprise, these kids ate a lot, and they took in at least 50% of their total caloric needs with table food. So compared to, if you add on what we were giving them with the defined formula diet and what they were eating on their own, they were probably taking about 150% of the calories that we felt were necessary. But again, 50% table food. The next column, which is the exclusive enteral nutrition group, these kids got between 90 and 100% of their caloric needs, and 45% of these people, were, uh, 45% were able to obtain their outcome measure of a calprotectin under 250. And the anti-TNF group was 62%. There was no statistical difference between the anti-TNF group and the exclusive enteral nutrition group. But clearly the kids that ate more table food did not do as well as the other two groups. And so if you look at the kids who didn't do well, again, they had 80 to 90% of their calories with a defined formula diet. The other kids, the exclusive enteral nutrition, they had 90 to 100. So both groups actually had gotten a lot of formula. If there was something special about this formula, this defined formula diet, if there was an anti-inflammatory component, you would think both groups would have done well. But that wasn't true. And our conclusion is that enteral nutrition therapy is effective due to the exclusion of table food. Now this is actually an induction study, where what they did here is they did use partial enteral nutrition where they gave 50% of a defined formula diet, and they also put the children on a Crohn's disease exclusion diet. So it's really a special diet, and we're gonna talk a little bit about that or the science behind that. And kids on this diet, they showed at the end of eight weeks that there was a significant improvement in the PCDAI, CRP, CEDRA, and albumin. There was a 70% remission rate in this population. 
Seven of the kids refused to do the defined formula diet, and they only did the Crohn's disease exclusion diet, and six or seven of them went into remission. So what are some of the things that are possibly in table food that could cause inflammation? Well, this is an animal model, the IL-10 deficient mouse that we all know, this model. If you give this animal milk fat, it actually increases the production of taurine conjugated bile acids. These bile acids create an environment in the intestinal tract that promotes the growth of Bilophilia wadsworthia, which is a very inflammatory organism. So you give this mouse milk fat, you could precipitate a colitis. This is a UC study where they looked at 191 patients uh, that were in remission, and they followed for one year. At the end of the year, 52% of the people had a flare in their disease. They looked back at, well, who were the population? What was different about the people who had a flare compared to the people who stayed in remission? And they showed that this population ate more red meat and processed meats. So hypothesis two, diet alters the gut microbiome, which leads to inflammation. This was a study where they looked to see, is there any type of grouping that occurs in, in people in their gut microbiome. And so what this study showed is that people's guts, you sort of are divided into one of three enterotypes, a bacteroides, a prevotella, or a ruminococcus. And in the study, they said, okay, so we see that it seems like people have one of these enterotypes. They tried to look at what may be determine which enterotype you had, and they were actually unable to determine that. They looked at nationality, gender, age, BMI, without success. Then we did a study at Penn, we called the COMBO study. It was a cross-sectional study of diet and stool microbiome. And we asked the question, are nutrients associated with specific bacterial taxa? So if you look at this heat map, if you look at the columns, and I have two columns labeled, a bacteroides column and a prevotella column, the rows are nutritional supplements, carbohydrates, fats. And you could see here that there's a clear clustering of binutritional groups. And there's an inverse relationship between carbohydrates and amino acids and fat and fiber. I mean, if you look at the bacteroides group, now I should say red means that you eat a lot of the product, and blue means you don't eat very much of the product at all. So you could see if you look at the bacteroides, they don't eat a lot of carbohydrates, but they eat a lot of meats and fats, while the Prevotella people eat more carbohydrates and less fats. To look at just these two important columns that I was mentioning, and again, red means that you eat the product, and blue means you eat it rarely. And you could see that enterotype one, or the Bacteroides, these are people who ate more animal products. They had more of the westernized diet. The enterotype two for the Prevotella, and these people, again, ate more, had more of a vegetarian diet. And many studies have shown that the Bacteroides, or the enterotype one, is associated with, more disease, with many different diseases. Now again, this is long-term diet, so we looked at people over a long period of time, what do they eat? If you can't change your enterotype, if all of a sudden you're a vegetarian and you have a hamburger, you're not gonna change to a new enterotype. It takes time for that to happen. Now this is a very, I think, interesting organism. Bacteroides, the teoteomicron. What this organism does is it takes complex carbohydrates glycan, soluble fiber, it takes that and metabolizes that substrate and produces short-chain fatty acids. We need short-chain fatty acids for survival. It helps our colonocytes live, as well as it results in the proper working of our immune system. So let's say if you put somebody on a low-fiber diet, which we, do to our IBD, which we used to do to our IBD patients, this organism actually will transcribe a gene that will now allow it to digest a protective mucus layer in our intestinal tract as a substrate to make its short-chain fatty acids. So again, looking at this, you know, unless if somebody has a critical stricture, I think we should stop telling people to go on low-fiber diets. Now, hypothesis three, diet determines the metabolic products of gut microbes which impact health and disease. So again, uh, what we eat, is, is a substrate for a bacteria. And the bacteria produces metabolites that we need for survival, neurotransmitters, branched-chain amino acids, short-chain fatty acids, as I mentioned. So we need our bacteria to survive, and we need to feed them the right foods. So this is a little bit of a model I put together where there needs to be a genetic predisposition. Then during maybe the first three years of life, we create somewhat of a stable microbiome. 
And that microbiome will determine on probably the mode of delivery, the food that we feed our babies, maybe the antibiotics and the medicines that they're exposed to. And in some cases, especially in westernized countries, uh, they, we probably develop somewhat of, a, somewhat of an inflammatory microbiome. But that's not enough to give you IBD. Then you have to have a second environmental hit, something like an infection, maybe the use of antibiotics, non antibiotics, something that causes pathologic inflammation. And then the perpetuation of this inflammation can be caused by the diet and the diet's effects on the microbiome. So I guess the question we ask, and Athos mentioned this as we started, should we be immunosuppressing our patients? If we believe that IBD arises from inappropriate handling of intestinal bacteria. So again, I'm not showing any induction data for the remainder of this talk, because I think we've all seen a lot of that. But let's talk a little bit about maintenance therapy with enteral nutrition for Crohn's disease. This was an adult study where they took patients who were in remission with a, CD, with a, PC, with a CDAI of less than 150. And this, the method was a prospective study. 50% of the people received a, their calories from an elemental diet, and the other group had just a normal diet. The primary endpoint was at one year. They looked at clinical remission, endoscopic assessment, and mucosal cytokine concentrations. And you could see here that at the end of one year, the group that was placed in the enteral nutrition group, the 50% enteral nutrition, were more likely to be in remission at the end of one year when compared to the normal diet group. Then they looked at mucosal healing. And you could see a baseline for both groups was very comparable. At the end of one year, the group that was placed into the regular diet group clearly had more um, mucosal inflammation by endoscopic assessment than the group that was in uh, uh, the elemental diet group. Now, how about looking at inflammatory cytokines? Here they looked at IL-1 beta, IL-6, TNF-alpha. If you look at the enteral nutrition group, at entry was 102, and one year later was 110. There was no statistical increase for IL-1 beta for the enteral nutrition group. If you look at the normal diet group, it was 104 up to 150. Again, a significant improve, in, increase in IL-1 beta. Same story with IL-6, no change in the enteral nutrition group but an increase in the normal diet group. And next with TNF-alpha, same thing, no change in the enteral nutrition group, but a significant increase in the normal diet group. And the authors concluded that pro-inflammatory mucosal cytokines are significantly higher in a normal diet group at 12 months. Now this is a small study, it's sort of an interesting one, and again, it really needs to be repeated because the sample size was small. But it, in this particular case, they took a group of patients and they put them on somewhat of a Japanese diet. They were only allowed to eat fish once a week and meat every other week. The way this study was done, which would never be, I think, allowed with our IRBs in the United States, they took patients who required hospitalization and, in this particular case, infliximab to go into remission. Then they would discharge, and one group went on a semi-vegetarian diet, and the other group went on more of a westernized diet. Both groups stayed on their infliximab for approximately one year. At the end of this time, they discontinued the infliximab in both groups. And you could see that the group that had the normal diet, uh, they flared by stopping their infliximab, while surprisingly, the group that was randomized into the semi-vegetarian uh, diet seemed to do quite well at the end of one year. So in summary, maintenance of remission for Crohn's disease. There's, there's evidence, and I only have a short amount of time to go through all the evidence, there's a much greater amount of evidence, to show that partial nutrition, 50% of caloric needs given by formula, either PO or NG, is capable of keeping people in remission. There's limited evidence to support this Crohn's disease exclusion diet, but that's something that right now at CHOP we're doing sort of extensive studies with um, to again see if we could uh, repeat some of the data that came out of Israel early in the year. So future direction, the challenge moving forward will be to provide evidence for dietary influences on the intestinal microbiome that has meaningful effects on human physiology. Changing the intestinal microbiome through dietary modifications may ultimately prove a powerful approach to disease prevention and therapy. So one of the questions I get asked often is like, how do you do this? Now the induction, I think we all know how to do. It's eight to 12 weeks, 80 to 100% of caloric needs, and you could give it by NG or PO. How do you do maintenance? 
So at CHOP, what we do is once a person goes into remission, and again, they, you know, no therapy works for everybody. The person has to go into remission on the uh, induction approach. Then what we do every maybe two months, we decrease their enteral nutrition from 10 to 15%. Now you could decrease the number of days they get the infusion, the NG feeds, which I think most kids sort of take away the Saturday night and then the Friday night. Or I have some patients that just want to decrease the volume that they get at night. And we keep repeating this until we get down to about a 50-50 table food to enteral nutrition. Okay, thank you.